Hey, thanks for being here on today's podcast. Today I'm in conversation with a new friend, a guy called Ken Olin. Ken is a Hollywood star. Uh, he is so well known in, for his body of work as an actor, writer, director, producer, and his current uh, thing that he's working on is a fantastic show that I love called This Is Us. He is the executive producer, director of This Is Us, and we spoke about his creative process, um, some of his history in his work through Hollywood and the different roles he has had, the hats he's worn. Does he prefer directing over acting? Does being an actor make him a better director and vice versa? Um, does he have techniques for his approach to his craft that would be an insider information for lots of you out there that are in that whole world too? Um, is there a common thread through his life we spoke about that gave him a sense of... Um, calling an intuition he'd followed through his life, a narrative to bring him to where he is now. Any near misses that he's had in his life, things that, uh, parts that he didn't get because he was late or he didn't get the, you know, sliding door moment. They say a lot of actors have that. I think all humans have that. But it was just a fascinating conversation about fatherhood, his kids and uh, his aspirations and so on for the future. So you're going to love this conversation. Don't forget to... Uh, uh, put a comment, tag me in, leave a review, hit subscribe if you don't already. Thank you. Enjoy. Hey, my friend, how are you? I'm good. How are you? I, I am well, thank you. Lovely to see you and, oh, and to meet you. Thank and you. thanks for your time. How are you? What is happening, by the way, there in your part of the world? COVID right now. Are you locked down or what? Uh, no, uh, we're not. No, we're not locked down. Unfortunately, you know, it seems like people here... I guess you probably have this perspective on our country, but you know, there's a sense of entitlement and um, right. arrogance, and you know, I, I I don't quite there's a there's such a backlash against wearing masks as, as if it's right. some kind of imposition on people's freedoms that are you know that's arbitrary. It, it, so as soon as there's any uh, any um, loosening up of the restrictions, then it, there's just like an, a, a mass uh, exodus to the streets and to the restaurants. And, you know, we've been working, um, we, we've been pretty much working since September nonstop. I mean, we had, we've had, we shut down at Christmas for a couple of weeks and we shut down, uh, we've had to shut down a couple of days because we've had, um, just a few, but if we have anybody test positive, then we usually shut down for a day or two to, to just, uh, you know, contract trace and everything like that. But wow. uh, we've been pretty good. Um, what are you, you working know, on at the moment, Ken? Uh, I'm doing a show called This Is Us. Oh, yeah, I was going to talk to you about that. I've got a whole lot of questions because I love that show. Oh, thanks. Thanks. Where are I'm you right a, now? I'm in England, in the north of England, and we wa I watched the show on Amazon. Um, Although Amazon seems to really stagger the episodes. There's weeks go between them posting episodes. I don't know why. So we're all like, it's not on next week. It's been three weeks or whatever. It's pretty random. No, I, I don't know what, you know, where they are in terms of how they post them. I know, I mean, that part of that is the show. We, we normally were, we've probably finished, even, even at the most, you know, when we get really into crunch time, we usually have one or two episodes in the can ready to go after the one that airs. We're pretty much airing the episodes as we finish them. I mean, we got wow. so far behind. So for wow. instance, I finished the 10th episode, directing the 10th episode of the season on a, I think it was a, a Monday and it was on the following Tuesday. So, I mean, that's really, really up wow. against it. So it sure is. that's 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 what we're dealing with. So that may be part of the reason why it's so oh. intermittent right now. I mean, you know, we're we're probably going to do 16 episodes this season. Normally we do 18 and we're finished in February. This year we'll do 16 and we'll be finished in May. So it's it's been, you know, it's been really disruptive. It's such an amazing show, Ken. It really is. Where did okay. the idea for the show come from? Uh, I, well, Dan Fogelman, who um, is a creator, the writer of the show, I think he had an I, I, he had um, he had this idea for a movie, and I think he wrote. 
I don't know how much he, you know, he, I think he probably wrote about half of a movie and he put it away. And then whatever that was five years ago, I guess now five or six years ago, he took it out. He wrote it as a television pilot um, and he turned it in. I, I think, I think some of it came from, you know, he, he, he lost his mom uh, when she was fairly young, I think, um, you know, she was in her early 60s, I think. And um, he, I think part of, it, of dealing with that, you know, uh, I think there was some of that. And I think he's been playing in his mind as a writer for a while with the notion of time and, and the way that it's fluid in the show. Um, but you know, I, that's that's as certain as much as I know. He's 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 fairly circumspect about those things. You know, he uh, he, he doesn't he doesn't tend to uh, to like he doesn't tend to do a lot of self analysis. And it, you know, when he talks about his creativity, I think he there's some. I think he has a kind of a, a life view, and that's what you see in the show I and mean, whatever that life view is that's dan's life view so it took quite a while you know to get into you know the show leaps backwards and forwards yeah on some shows and then to the present and it took me i think a good two seasons to settle into not trying to think to just watch it continuously effortlessly yeah. without trying to think hang on is that past is the future it's that rhythm I had to settle into. Are you finding that a lot with viewers? Because it's it's a very unusual show that way. Yeah, I, you know, I think it was always. I mean, when we when we started out from the beginning, we made a decision that filmically we did not want to separate those two experiences. We did wow. we didn't want them to be. We didn't want the past or even the future to be experienced as a flashback or experienced as a flash forward, unless there were very, very specific reasons for doing that. I think the idea was that those experiences emotionally take place in whatever moment of time you're experiencing them. So yeah. the hope was that we would be able to create that experience for an audience, that if you're watching Jack and Rebecca in 1980, their experience of those of that time was immediate that it, it was a, their present so that was unusual because we you know normally in all the television i've done you know you there's some version of pushing into somebody's close up and then you right. go to the past and you get oh it's their memory um we deliberately didn't do that i mean there was a the whole sense early on um it, it, that we wanted to create a little more of an objectified kind of narrative than the one that you normally see on television. Normally on television, um, which is somewhat different, I think, than movies, um, the narrative is very much from a, the, of a, a point of view. It's normally from the emotional right. point of view, a scene is shot. And it, that's something that you, know, you always talk about as a director and mm. is a, okay, whose point of view is this? Um, and that's because you know the investment is in the characters on a week to week basis and ongoing. So the notion of point of view would just, that was the primary, um, that was the primary consideration in terms of the way you would approach a scene, which character's point of view is it from. And right from the beginning, I think with this, and maybe it's because uh, of Dan's background in movies or it, it, right from the beginning, the idea was let's try to objectify the narrative more than you normally see on television so that I think as a consequence, the time thing doesn't feel like it has to be a memory because no. you're not always shooting, you know, over the shoulder of the character. It's, there's a, seems to be a more, I guess, more of a saga. Yeah. Um, the yeah. notion was of it, saga. Was it, the, and, was it the original idea, Ken, to write it from, because one of the things I love about the show and people I talk to that are huge fans of it, is it's almost like being in therapy each week because it tracks people's trauma in their adult life to their childhoods. And it does that so brilliantly. And it doesn't feel indulgent. It doesn't feel overdone. It doesn't feel corny or cheesy. It feels like it's written from someone's soul as if someone's walked that path to be able to write it so well. 
-hmm. It feels organic. It feels like me. It feels like people I know. That's one of the, to me, the part of the magic of the show is that yeah. huge sense of connectivity it has with ordinary people. Where's that come from? It's just brilliant. Well, I mean, I think that's a combination of, of Dan's voice. Um, I think the actors, um, it's, it's a, it's a, a, it's a very warm and um, right. genuinely affectionate and kind right. and generous place to work. Um, I think the actors are, that's, that's a true thing that you see. So part of that, my feeling is like, part of that is just fundamentally the feeling of intimacy, whatever that is. Like when you're watching it, you feel a kind of intimacy. I think that's because the feelings, the, the, the respect and the decency of the cast towards one another and, and towards Dan and the writers and the respect they feel and hopefully an environment that I've helped create is one that, that is, is, there is a sense of an unconditional love that connects all these people. And I guess for this group, that unconditional love, rather than it necessarily coming through the blood or whatever of a family, it comes through a respect for the scripts and, wow. and, and the writing. And I think that's part of what you feel because I find, and I found in comparison to some, a couple of other shows that I've worked on, it's not a particularly therapeutic um, model that we're using. I, I, this is, you know, a lot of the writers that Dan brought on, the two uh, writers that are his protégés, um, Elizabeth Berger, Isaac Aptiker, they are people that come, they come first from comedy. And comedy oh. people tend like not to like drama. They don't like a lot of drama. I mean, Dan doesn't like a lot of drama. It took me a while to get used to it. I kept thinking, okay, there's some something here is not, you know, I kept looking over my shoulder because I come from drama. So it's, you know, paranoia and and yeah. people are deceptive. And this group is not. And they, oh no, no, let's not have a lot of drama in the room. And consequently, there's not a lot of self-scrutiny. Um, it doesn't come from that. So it's interesting that, that you experience that because I think people do Definitely. experience the show as being, wow, we're so close to these people and looking at the ways in which this influenced that. And, and like you said, some of the trauma. And But I think it comes from a, a, a feeling of, of closeness to them and a way that you're, yeah. you're allowed in, in a very... Uh, a very safe way, despite you know the conflicts that they have and and um, how how there can be real anger, or cruelty, or whatever it, cruelty maybe not so much, but the, the real anger or the confusion. I do think um, there is fundamentally this trust and this love that transcends all of that, and that is is probably what people experience more than anything. I feel that too, Cam, because I think. It feels so nuanced to me. That's why it's almost like, I don't know how nuance can be scripted, but so how do you get it in there? What I mean is, especially with Milo's character, Jack, it feels like less is a lot more with Milo. I don't know how he does that. It, it, is, it is a look, it is. We talked a lot about that early on. You know, I love working with Milo. Milo and I are very, very close. One of the things, and this evolved to some extent was, you know, as when, it, when the show began very early on, and one of the first scripts that um, that we did, one of the things I talked about was that I felt his character had to be different than Mandy's character and the th and basically the three kids. In that, I thought he could not be as art he he was not as verbal. That was fundamentally oh. what I felt, and I think that that's something that. Um, Dan really took to heart and we talked about that, that it was really interesting that his, you know, when you, I mean, Justin Hartley, brilliant and, and, yeah. and Sterling and Mandy and Chrissy and Chris, Chris saw, I mean, these, they're all so dexterous yeah. verbally totally. and so smart and their, and their comedy, the way they use. And one of the things we kept talking about Milo and I, which is he's, he comes from a different place. And I think that's something that he really went, okay. And we, there is a more 
for lack of a, a probably a more sophisticated term, he, there is something working class about him. He is a more of a working class individual. And that's very, you know, that's nuanced for him because it's, it's, it has nothing to do with intelligence. It just has to do with the things that are at his disposal. And then he has these three kids that are, you know, just wildly articulate, worldly, sophisticated, affluent, you know, and he is, he's a little more of the salt of the earth, you know, and I mean, and Milo is, he's fabulous. So. To what degree, I mean, I was going to ask you this, I'm, I'm fascinated to know from you, Ken, coming from an acting background, yourself mm -hmm. now, um, I heard Milo on a panel discussion, and he talked about uh, Jack is a stoic character, therefore doesn't cry much. Now, mm. does does Milo decide that? Does do the do the actors mm -hmm. decide what to bring to that character? Or is that scripted? It's. I think it's probably. Um, you know, it's it's a little bit of an organic evolution. I think that. I don't know whether the decision was made. You know, he should or shouldn't cry as much. But the decision as it evolved was that those things are not as accessible to him. Um, okay. And then, and then, you know, the, the, uh, the way Milo and I, when we're working together, the way we modify that is more specific to the moment. I think, you know, Milo brought a lot of that to the work in terms of the stoicism, the, but I think part of it just came from Jack's in terms of his background, which is there, which Milo didn't create the background. Uh, I didn't mm. create the background. Dan created this background, is a character who was damaged, who grew up with an alcoholic and right. uh, who does not have, you know, who self-medicated for years. Um, but I don't think he has had the access to those things. You know, I don't think this is not a character who's right. been in therapy, who did, but I think that, you know, he, he, I don't think he had the, um, I don't think that would have felt safe to him. I mean, the, mm -hmm. the access to those emotions, um, you know, one of the most brilliant things still in the show is that scene that he does the, the, in the pilot, you know, when he's, he cannot find the words. He can't, he, all he has is that, you know, which we can, we've continued to work on and we've talked about it and used as a template, but, you know, this, he, all he has is this kind of certainty, this blunt certainty. And he doesn't have room for all of the different, you know, the shadings of those things of experience, as opposed to uh, Mandy's character or, or certainly yes. Sterling's character. You know, Sterling's always crying. <laughs> it's like, stop yeah, crying. right, right. Yes. Yeah. How the hell did you find such an amazing cast? I mean, oh, seriously, I that was Dan, and that was Dan, and 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 uh, Glenn Ficarra, John Reckwith. That was the pilot. You know, I mean, uh, I mean, do these people literally audition? I mean, because yes, I'd think, well, you could have missed these people. Then you can't oh, imagine no, anybody else playing absolutely. it. You're absolutely right. I think that too. I go. This is, and by the way, that these these ensembles like that. Yeah. I mean, I've been fortunate. I think I've been part of that when I did this show called 30 something. Yes, the brothers and sisters, was, I that saw that, yeah. That. that, and I, you know, we all, that was one of those ensembles that it's, I don't know what it was because it's not it's all, as if, oh, you know, the seven of us were so similar or, right. you know, we, we were all like, we all knew each other, we all loved each other, and we all went to college together. It, it wasn't, right. it was, just something, that, and this group that was put together, it's like, I, you know, there are um, cast members that are closer than other cast members. There are mm -hmm. real friendships, and then there are just real, real, um, okay, we're companions, we're, we work really well together, we're, we're, you know, we're collaborators, but there's something about the chemistry of this. Right is you know that's happens once maybe twice in your life like it's just an extraordinary group and it is it is that way it, it is just that way and a lot of that comes from the top a lot of it comes from Dan Fogelman a, an environment that he creates and a, a real fundamental um uh decency and honesty and support you know that's rare but but uh but I think you're right like wow you 
could have missed this. I mean, just right. who knew? you know, like you just don't know that it's going to happen like that. And you and do you, you think try. as much as, you know, people say, oh, we have a no asshole policy or, oh, you know, this is I've worked with this person. You just don't know that that it's right. a lot, there's a lot of chemicals that go into this chemistry. And exactly. Yeah. Do you think being an actor can make you a better director? If so, why? Uh, I think it makes me a better director of actors. I'm not self-conscious about the language I use to communicate with actors. I think so much of the time um, people struggle with actors because they become very self-conscious. They believe that they're, and actors are, you know, as any really creative people are, they have their, their, their things that go along with being a good actor and being in the right place emotionally to do good work and you know the talent what 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 comes along with that kind of talent but i think a lot of times people are are nervous with actors because they don't have a language there is something about someone who is in a kind of heightened emotional sensitized state when they come to work which is so different than the way most people come to work an actor has to be very um they have they have to be in a place of being sensitized to do good work and that's a complicated sort of thing sometimes to deal with a lot of the time you know in, in uh the actors that if you talk to the cast about working with me they'll imitate me and i seem like wildly inarticulate i don't complete sentences they they laugh they i mean i i seem so much more eccentric than i feel like i am in my life and i think part of why i work well with them is that sometimes it's about just the way i sound or i'm trying i'm i'm merely trying to motivate them and communicate something to them that they can then um, incorporate, integrate, and then bring forward in terms of their performance. So I think whatever that is, I, I'm, I'm certainly, a, I'm a much, much better actor as a director than I was as an actor. I was more self-conscious and stuff. And that intellectual approach or whatever to acting, it was very difficult for me to completely suspend that and give myself over. But I can do that, you know, as a director. And I, I think that the shortcoming, I would say, about being an actor and then a director is, I might be limited at times in terms of my perspective on material. And I very much approach material, um, I analyze material from the perspective of an actor. I, I do oh. know that. And there were all sorts of other things that are difficult because it's a different personality, part of your personality you use to direct. I had a lot to learn about that to become a, a real director. I want an actor to give a truthful performance, an emotionally truthful performance. And also it's a priority of mine that the actor give the most intelligent interpretation of a character's behavior and actions and choices that's there. I always try to lead towards that. But at the same time, I struggle probably more with imposing an interpretation based on the intentions of the writer than, right. a, than a director who is not, who doesn't make performance and the truthfulness of an actor's performance the priority. Do you miss acting, Ken? No, I don't. I, I, I think sometimes I do. I think, well, like when I see what, you know, I go like, uh, you know, I'm very close with Justin Hartley and, and very close with my what's up and I go, oh man, look at these guys. Like they come in, you know, whatever their new car is or they get treated incredibly well or you go anywhere and everybody loves them. And I'm thinking, I'm like, I, I am in a van driving around all the, you know, all these places trying to figure out where to work. I'm up really late at night at all the stress of this stuff. And they're like in makeup and, and I go, oh man, you know, I remember Harrison Ford, when someone asked Harrison Ford, why do you want, you know, why aren't you directing? And he said, well, why would I want to work three times as hard for a third of the money? And, you know, it's like, ah, there's that. But I, I, I feel 
I feel so much more fully engaged and fully used up as a director. Wow. I always have. And I, 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 I love directing. And I, 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 I think actors, especially actors that get to be my age, the ones that are really good, they, they love acting. They just wow. you can't, you know, there are just actors that, and I look at these actors, I, I look at, actors as they go through their 30s and 40s, 50s, 60s, and they're, and they're incredible. I mean, Anthony Hopkins, my God, I mean, he's incredible. Right. And, you know, he loves acting. I, you know, I don't, you know, whether, whatever he says, and I think he does talk about how much he loves her. He talked about how easy it is, like, you gotta be kidding me. He loves it. Huh. And Stella Adler used to say that an actor has to love the art in them, not themselves in the art. And there you go. that's, I think, the thing that, like, I could see why I would really love myself being an actor still, but that's not the same thing as loving that gift. And you want look at these people like, you know, like Anthony Hopkins or these actors that are, I mean, even you take people like Leonardo DiCaprio, but I mean, you go, they really respect that in themselves. They love that gift. And it keeps them going. And if you don't have that, acting is just, it's just hard. People aren't good at it. They're vain. And they, you know, and I just didn't have that, that gift. Um, the gift to be able to just take a leap and be fully in it and, and embrace it. I, I, I feel that way more. Wow. Right. Because I, I was going to ask you, is there a common thread through your life, Ken, that you could track back that, that creates this narrative of your life? Was it something when you were young, an intuitive thing, a calling, a sense of passion that took you into this world that you're in? Is there a common thread through Because what you described there is this internal art that people um, go into and live from, like Antony Hopkins and others, they have this internal love of what they do. It's not external. Have you had that through your life? And how has that allowed you to change hats and keep that intact? I always acted like a little bit in school plays, but it, you did. It yeah. never, me growing up, that was just never, that was never. Um, so it wasn't obvious. No, God. And it was certainly not an obvious direction to take. My, oh. my family were businessmen and lawyers. And, and then I, when I was in college, I sort of backed into like, I realized it was the only thing I loved doing. And oddly enough, it was I, we, where I went to school. Um, it was, there was a club. There wasn't, mm. there weren't like, it wasn't an act, there weren't, it wasn't an acting program. So we were very independent. I didn't have teachers, which is probably a fortunate thing because when I finally did have acting teachers, they were some of the best acting teachers in the world because wow. they were, you know, they were in their own studios. Um, I, I, in this club and I would act and do that. I directed this play because uh, it was part of the club. So I said, I'll direct the play. It, it was it was almost terrifying to me because it was so consuming emotionally and physically. I I, I was so it, I, it was like I just I was just deeply immersed in it. I had no tools. I didn't. It was all I had was this obsession and passion, and I didn't. So it scared me. And I I but I I stayed with acting until eventually you know I, I was in a position to direct, but. I think from that moment on, then it felt like a call, like it was the only thing that I loved. I, I, just, I it was, was, and it was so weird because I loved it and it was so um, like, you know, talk, like it's like, it was like putting on clothes that were like, wait, this is not, this isn't normally how I would dress. It would be like for me to be dressed. You know, I've dressed basically the same way since high school. So, you know, it, it felt like, wait, being an actor, you know, my mom was like, wait, what? You know, it was just, yeah, that was a weird choice. But I, I, I just, I, I loved it. And I, I don't, I don't even know what I, I don't know what I would have done if, if it hadn't worked out okay. But I didn't know I, that my, that my talent in the sense that the thing that would really make me, make me happy and keep me going and drive me was directing. I mean, acting for me became a bit of a of drudgery to use the word Ron Howard used. Mm -hmm. It was like, it, it did become, 
for me really like, uh, you know, uh, putting, you know, that, and like when you act, do I miss acting? I, I, I do. And within, if I, when I ever somebody, sometimes, you know, I'll be working with someone who knows that I did Thursday and they'll think like JJ Abrams wrote a part on alias for me. Cause he thought that was so funny to see me, you know, act or whatever, but I miss acting sometimes whenever I have until about the first half an hour of makeup. <laughs> and then I'm like, I, I don't miss it. I don't, it doesn't, I don't, I can't, I can't ever give myself fully to it. It just wow. doesn't, it just doesn't. But directing, uh, when I, when, you know, start finding something that I love or, you know, we start launching a show, uh, I, I just am fully, you know, to, I lose all, um, I, I lose all self-consciousness. Like if I, if people imitate me, I sit at a monitor. It's so embarrassing. Somebody, um, I think Justin filmed me at the monitor and I make all the actors, especially the actresses, which my daughter thinks is really, I act out everything. I'm like going like, and everybody laughs. I, 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 uh, I was directing Alias once and Lena Olin was sitting, no relation, but God, she's awesome. But, um, you know, and, there's, and I turn it and it was cut and she looks at me and she goes, do you do that when I act? And I was like, yeah, probably. I just, that's what I mean. I, I'm, I'm doing that more than I, I lose myself that way. I couldn't lose myself that way as an actor. And that's what, oh. that's what the great actors do. You know, but I'm not, I only can do it at the monitor. It's a great response because what you're really saying, especially to the emerging generation, and I say this often to young people when they say, how do you find your purpose, your calling? And I've always answered by following your internal sort of radar, your internal GPS, whatever you call it, which is what you're talking about. This internal desire and love of what you do that is stronger in your directing than it was in your acting. Yes. And then finding that space and staying there, it surely must give longevity and more happiness and fulfillment to your life as you age to have made that transition to that sweet spot you're in now. Do you find that with young people? Do you teach? Is, are, you, are you a teacher? And, and yeah, are young I do a lot. struggling with that more? Or yeah. have you found that I, changing? Or? I think it's a big question there. Gen my generation, your generation, the baby boomers and so on, we didn't have to worry about that to get, you know, get married, get a job, pay the bills. But this generation are so in, in tune with this sense of a calling and a passion and a purpose. They want to make a difference and uh, do something in the world and deal with world problems, but they don't know how to find which way to pursue that. They're fed up of education, many of them, because the education system is broken. It's just one size fits all. It doesn't celebrate different kinds of intelligence that the kids have. This right brain generation, my generation was more left brain logic. These kids are creative and they want connection. So I get yeah. that quite a lot, Ken. Yeah. So when you said it's good for them to hear you say what you just said about sitting behind the camera, being as engrossed in the acting, but from a director's perspective, it's like the best of both worlds you now have. Uh -huh. But you have, but you have made, it seems to me you have made peace with this essence of yourself of, this is what I love to do. And it comes from inside of you. You don't need to be in front of the camera to fulfill that in you. No. You're loving it from where you're sitting. And I think the kids to know that, and that's why I said about the track through your life, I think to follow this, in, this internal sense of true north, whatever you finish up calling it, will always put you where you should be, I think. Well, it's, you know, it's so interesting that you're saying that. And I, I, I mean, you're so great. I love these questions. You're so um, support of it, but I, I I noticed with our son who's in his mid thirties, he was a writer. He he was a uh, and he was doing incredibly well. I mean, he was a Hollywood writer on Brothers and Sisters. He was honest with you know makes you make a lot of money in Hollywood. Right. Well, even even the low level, it's still it's a, and he was so unhappy. He, wow. he he I don't you know part of it was. And this is a curse, I think, you know, it, it, it's, it's a curse that is a, a nice curse when you grow up in Hollywood and your parents have success. Uh, for a lot of the kids here, they want that life. They haven't experienced, like, I don't, I don't want what my, I don't want my parents' life. I, I didn't right. want my parents' life. That was a beginning thing. It's like, whatever, I didn't know at all what I wanted, but I, I didn't. And he, I think, he had the talent or whatever. He was so unhappy. 
And it took him a long time. He, he, he sold his house. I mean, he had owned a house when he was 29. And he's now a personal trainer in Denver. But he, he met this woman in Africa. He spent, they went to Africa, they traveled. She's a teacher, public school teacher. She's like a superstar public school teacher. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I know what you're talking about. In a, I think in the United States, hey, people, they're struggling with this probably in a way in Europe they're not because there's such, something so spoiled in our country. But, mm -hmm. but this search for what you're talking about is how do we lead a, a, a meaningful life to that is a mm -hmm. life that is fulfilled. It's, they're not nowhere near as materialistic they don't, right. it's not about, they don't need the money. It's not, you know, yeah. okay, how do we get by? She, te and he does this training. I think it's been very hard for him to reconcile himself with how different that is than the life. You know, he still, he loves, you know, some of the things he had, like, oh, all that really great sushi you get on the West side of Los Angeles and all, <laughs> like, you can't do those things. But right. the idea of leading a life in an environment and in a way that is makes them happy or healthier is really interesting. I think the problem here is, I don't know here. I, I see what's happening in, in Europe and these young people, like you said, who are much more political. I mean, mm -hmm. we went through that whole phase where it was, you know, they are, they, they, they're searching for some meaning. And that's yeah. interesting what you're saying about how do you, to, it's easy to celebrate someone who finds that in Hollywood because, uh, mm. and I don't think that's, that's that thing Stella was saying about love the art in you, not yourself in the art. If that isn't, right. that isn't who you are. I, right. I look now, you know what I do? I look now and I envy, I mean, certainly, you know, we'll see what happens, but oh, those, those young lawyers or whatever, the political, the people that are out there really, Oh, they're so, you know, intellectually engaged. It's so fervently engaged with those things. That seems to me like, whoa, that's, that's. But I, I really think, Ken, honestly, um, I watch a lot of stuff and I really feel that you are capturing, you are doing that through This Is Us. It is, mm -hmm. it that's is right. magnificent. It is absolutely speaking to human needs. It's addressing the race issue. It's addressing mm -hmm. abandonment and trauma and loneliness and depression and alcoholism um, and all those things that it's like watching it, as I said, is therapy. And I, as I watch it, I can think of different stages of my life and people I know. And I think for me, and like for your son, you mentioned, I think so many people, I think I've got to my midlife and I think so much of my life was lived as someone else's version of me. And then this midlife crisis language is around the idea that somewhere in your midlife, you wake up to this realization, I have not lived my life. I mm -hmm. have lived someone else's version of my life for whatever reason, to people please or to pay the bills. But now I've got less life in front of me than behind me. I need to live my life. And I think that's mm -hmm. happening all around the world. This awakening of mm -hmm. consciousness, Ken, that I think your program absolutely speaks to every time I watch it. I think it's amazing for doing that. So I think you're doing your own version of the lawyer's work sometimes we envy <laughs> through the program. You really are. That's, thanks. Thank you. We try. How do you switch off, Ken? What are your hobbies, interests outside of? I read, I read a lot. I got a Peloton yeah. bike, so I'm trying ah. to get myself back in shape a little bit. <laughs> I tried to learn how to play guitar when I was in my 40s. I'm not a musician. Are you a musician? No. No, I, I'm not a musician, but I, I always like had this thing. I so wanted to be a rock and roll guy. And I, so I finally at 47, having no musical um, background at all. So I, I got really good at, at buying guitars. Uh, I didn't get very, I mean, I, you know, I got, okay. The problem was it, it's such a, I approached it, I can't help but approach it analytically. And, and that, that mu music as a language, I, it just, I, I don't have it. I mean, I, it's not a, I can't let it go. You know, it's like acting. I couldn't just let it go. Like I, I would, had a wonderful guitar teacher and we were friends and he would say, you know, when I would ask him about like how to 
why something was, you know, why is the chord structured like, and it would be like, just no, okay, let's just play guitar now for a while. Let's just, let's just play it. It, it would, it was so hard. Um, oh, Stephen, I don't know if you know Stephen Pressfield, heard of Stephen Pressfield's work. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Stephen wrote um, uh, the Bag of Vance movie. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, anyway, he's wrote, he wrote all about his creative process and he talks about people have these, what he calls shadow careers. So they're in the neighborhood of what they'd love to do, but they don't have the courage to step up and do it. And it's quite hilarious because I thought of my own life, you know, it's the things you're drawn to, like a guitar, you'd like right. to be the guy on stage, but these guys finish it with the sound engineer all their life, wishing they were on stage. At least you've done the acting and the directing. You've done both sides of the camera. Um, <laughs> so maybe you maybe you have a shadow career of a musician somewhere lingering. There's time yet. <laughs> I, I, I know. I don't think so. Uh, it's so much practice, too. You know, that's another thing that was interesting about music. Because yeah. what I do, yes, there's a very, you know, I worked really hard. I trained really hard at, at, at acting to understand it. But it, and... I, as a director, there's tremendous amounts to learn, but I had never done anything, even though I played sports, I played, I played baseball and I played soccer through all through high school and into my freshman year in college. I had never, I never did anything that required practice the same way, right. like the way a gymnast does or a musician does. Like right. there, it's that, that was really interesting to me because I would get better. I mean, I definitely could make chord changes better and all of that stuff. Right. That was interesting. Then it became like, no, no, you have to do this for hours every right. day. And I think for me, my creative process has always been engaged with other people. That's, okay. you know, that's a really different, like a right. I've never been a writer. I, I have so many things I know. Uh, I could write this so much better. <laughs> of course, I can't because I can't. <laughs> but 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 that that was a really interesting thing about music of going. Oh, you actually, if you practice two hours, you actually get better. Right, you know, right. I, like you, you can find an actor, and that actor can take every class in the world. This person can take every class in the world, do scene study, do it, and they always suck. Like there, there right. is something fundamental about that talent that right. and directors at some point, yes, you can learn about lenses, you can learn all of those things, but if your taste and your ability to communicate and your story, no, but if you're a musician, you better practice. Right. And you know, you, and we, and that was fascinating to me about that. And I, you know, it's like golf, same thing. I, yes, that's why I never, exactly. Golf. I don't yeah. want to spend four hours. You enjoy yeah. being a dad, father? Yeah. Now, I mean, now I'm like dad of these, you know, older kids. Yeah. You know, I, I, um, are you a father? Yeah, I have eight grandkids too. Oh, you do? We don't yeah. have any. Oh, <laughs> uh, I think we may be anticipating our first grandchild soon. There you go. Yeah. Um, it was harder for me when they were really young because I had right. my own ambitions and I was just, easily distracted from, I'm very, very close to my kids. My daughter runs our company. I'm very close to oh, my daughter. Nice, um, yeah. Uh, she's sort of more like my soulmate and my son is very much his mom's soulmate. That's um, great, yeah. But yeah. We're really close by, I, that's the one thing I, I, I don't know that, it, it, I say, you know, I lo love being a dad. It's a, it's a really fair question going, you know, I, I love my children. I didn't love in an active, responsible way being mm -hmm. a dad when they were really little because I was so distracted and ambitious. And um, and now, well, sometimes I do. Sometimes it's like, oh my God, it's like, can't, you know? And, and it's weird because we got a puppy, we got a COVID puppy, yeah. uh, my wife and I. And I was so aware with this puppy of the different little, like when it was like just little stages of development. And I said to her, this is what's really, this is, I didn't have that with our kids. I wow. didn't, I wasn't, I, I was there. It wasn't that, the, I, I mean, I was there and I was a loving father, but I wasn't, 
I, I, I did not take that on equally to, to Patty. Like I just, I didn't. And going with this puppy going, oh my God, this, like this, you can actually see developmental changes in a little creature. And that I go, you know, I, 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 I wish, I wish that I, that's, I wish I had done that more. I think it would have been good for them and good for me, but we were, we're close now. We have a, we have a, we have an, a real relationship and they, and they know me, you know, they do know who I am. And that's a, I think that's a cool thing, you know, and that's that, the- I, that, that speaks to your growth, though, Ken, how you've kept yes. growing and evolving and reinventing and yourself. And I think you're going to love grandkids. Skip kids, go straight to grandkids, because the yeah. grandkids are all the fun and are they? the responsibility. Eight? And eight? I've got eight, yeah. They, they, they age from the, my oldest grandchild is nudging 18. My youngest is five, six girls, two boys, and the grandkids combo. They all live close by, five minutes away. People say, oh, must be wonderful having your grandkids close by. I'm like, oh, I'm not so sure about that. Because you're like, me and my wife are in this big old farmhouse here. We're like a sitting ducks for grandchild random oh, invasions. Yeah. But wait, you and your whole, the whole family is, is near you like that. They're literally five minutes. We're like the Walton's Mountain here. Oh, that's spectacular. <laughs> I was 16 when I got married. Um, our first child was born four months before we got married, and three I had twins then. So by the time I was by the time I was twenty, I had three kids because we had twins when I was nineteen. No one saw that coming. So since I was a kid, I've had kids. So I'm surprised any of them survived. <laughs> That's unbelievable. I know. We've um, been married forty eight years. Yeah, this year forty eight years. Yeah, we've been married. We've been married uh, thirty nine years. That's amazing, eh? Are you up for a little bit of quick fire before I let you go? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, all right, here's a few quick fire for you. Something people often get wrong about you when they talk about you or you hear them talking about you, they think you're not as funny or you are funny or you're funnier than, you know, and so on. Um, you're taller, you're shorter, whatever. I'm more uh, insecure than they think I am. There you go. Interesting. All right, second one. Last TV show you binge watched? The Bureau. Ah. Uh, Mine was uh, Queen's Gambit. Did you see that? Yeah, it was good. It was good. Have you seen The Bureau? Have you watched The Bureau? The The Bureau. Just two words, The Bureau. Yeah, it's called The Bureau. It's French. Um, You can get it on Amazon, I think. I'll look at that, Ken. Thanks for that heads up. I love watching stuff. It's incredible. The Bureau. So it's subtitles, is it? Yes. Okay. All right. Favorite movie? Well, I always say I well, I, I always say Godfather Two, so I'll say Godfather Two. Great choice. A concert or show you'll never forget that you've uh, been to. Seeing uh, the Rolling Stones at oh. Madison Square Garden, wow, uh, nineteen seventy-two. Wow, um, it, uh, it was Mick Jagger's birthday. Wow, what a fantastic memory! Favorite meal? I like cheeseburgers. There you go. Yeah. It's not very grand answer, is it? But it's like the no, honest truth. I, I, yeah, cheeseburgers. I've had some of the finest meals and thought, I'll, I've got to get a burger on the way home. <laughs> <laughs> what books are on your nightstand, Ken? What are you reading right now that you're enjoying? Uh, uh, I'm, uh, I'm just, I'm reading a, a, a book because I'm, I'm thinking of trying to do something with my friend, Matthew Reese. It's a very old book. It's called Law. It's called uh, Lost Undercover. It's a little Dell paperback and it's about a, a FBI agent who pretty much lost his mind undercover. And I've also got the new book by the Nobel Prize winner. Um, it just came out. I can't remember what it's called. I have the Obama autobiography. I just finished reading the Mike Nichols biography, which I loved. Uh, and then I have, um, uh, I have different thrillers. I like thrillers. So I'm really speaking of it. speaking of Obama presidents, a lot of us here are very glad that Trump's gone. By the way, <laughs> yeah, oh, that, yes, I, I get myself in a lot of wow. trouble on Twitter about that. I, I saw uh, some of your tweets, and I'm like, go Ken, yeah. Oh, I I. Uh, he, that, that, what that man is, is going to take us if we ever recover from what, what, right. what 
as he says, the former guy did to this country. And to, to, I, I can't even imagine what you all in the world thought about what was happening in this country. I mean, it was really stunning, wasn't it? It had to be oh. stunning. Like to look and go, this is, this is what's happening in the United States. This is absolutely extraordinary. Unbelievable. But now he's threatening he might be back in a few years. Yeah, we'll see. <laughs> I don't think he will. Thank Ken, you. epitaph. What would you like on your gravestone? Ever thought about that? Epitaph. What should we think about Ken when he's gone? What would you like us to think about you kind of thing? It, it would be nice to be remembered at all. <laughs> you know, uh, that, that I made right. some sort of, you know, I, I think maybe that I, I made some kind of contribution to making uh, people, you know, um, treat each other better, decency and, you know, right. that, that's all. Right. I mean, I, ordinary moment, an ordinary moment, Ken, that lights you up. Like for me, you mentioned the dog. My daughter and son-in-law got a new dog, a COVID dog, as you call it. I tell you, that dog just lights me up. Every time the dog sees me, she goes crazy. No uh, human treats me like that. Oh, yeah. I would say, um, yeah, I would say I have these moments. You know what really likes that? Like, I like taking the dog for a walk in the, in the morning. And when the, in California, the morning's nice because it's a little bit cooler uh, and the air yeah. is cleaner. And I love taking this. He's a, he's a little, uh, he's a Cavalier King Charles Spaniel. Yes. And just taking him for a walk, that kind of lights me up. You know? That's nice. I so miss America. I have a home in America. We have a, we've had a home for 10 years in Scottsdale in Phoenix, Arizona. Oh, really? So I, well, because yeah. we can't fly, we can't go. Because I've so missed the, going there this year and the weather and really? stuff and the swimming every day. Yeah. So looking yeah, forward to when we, get, when we get permission to fly again. Okay, a couple more. Last time you wrote a handwritten note or letter. A handwritten note or letter? Yeah, right. I haven't written a handwritten letter for a long time. I probably wrote a, a handwritten note to my, uh, to my wife, I think on her birthday, I wrote her a note. Because, um, you know, there we you couldn't go. go out or anything. So that, that's, those are the, probably the only handwritten notes I, I write. You know? And lastly, what are you most grateful for, Ken, this past year? Anything stand out for you on what you're most grateful for? Like as COVID had hidden serendipitous gifts and so on, because I've thought a lot about that. I'm really fortunate to have a job that we have not suffered uh, financially. Right. We haven't been isolated. Um, yeah. I'm surrounded by, you know, really responsible and really decent people. And I still, even though it's been arduous, I still get to be creative. I still have a creative life. That's great. Really fortunate. That's a great response. Listen, I think, sir, you are a total genius. Honestly, oh. I've looked at your work. I've watched what you've done. Oh I've researched so you a lot. Kind. I can't and believe I think, how kind you are. I think this is us is a gift to the planet. Honestly, it's not just a TV show to me. It is a gift to the planet. It's doing a lot for us humans out here beyond oh, what perhaps you understand. Wow. So, and I talk nice. to so many people who are in love with the show. So that. That internal love you talked about earlier, that you feel, um, it's coming through into the whole right. thing. It's infused with it. So thank you for the gift of that oh, show to the world. You. Seriously, uh, you're welcome. I really thank you. You're such a, a so you're such a cool guy. Much love to you and to your family and all the great work you are doing. And thank you again for giving me your time today. I really oh, appreciate man, thank it. Thank you so much. What a pleasure. Made my my week. Thank you. Thanks, my friend. All my people here in Europe and England are going to absolutely love this. I just know it's going to be an absolute knockout show for everybody. Thank you, my friend. 